Kate is a political scientist, but she was trained as a biochemist. Yeah. biochemist. And then they jumped to the ecological economics community and is very keen on political ecology subjects. Uh, I will say that mainly she worked uh, on two very important uh, thinkers. One is uh, the father, but where is the mother? No, uh, ecological economics. Um, I don't give you the name because you should know who is it. <laughs> and then um, also on uh, um, philosopher and scientist from French, Marcuse. Um, she published, I think, an edited book with Tommaso Luzzatti about uh, Beyond Reductionism. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, the title? Yeah, that's the title. And one of the last papers uh, that I want to promote because you published with a friend of mine, Pere Arisa, mm -hmm. is about uh, wind conflict in Catalonia. And Pere will, will discuss his thesis uh, this month in ICTA. I mean, she published uh, very different things and stuff, so I cannot list here. <laughs> but if, if you want to look at uh, the very eclectic work that she is doing in the last period, I invite you to look at uh, her website. That is Catherine with one T. Farrell. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Giacomo. Um, I, I apologize to everybody over here. I'm sorry I can't see you, but we are um, being uh, regulated in the way that we're going to be able to communicate by the physical configuration of the space which in which we are positioned. And uh, so I think that's an elegant uh, opening thought for us to begin a conversation about discourse analysis. Um, so I don't know how much we can do about that, but uh, please try and get my attention if you have uh, questions. If you stick the hand straight up and we'll see it. Um, Okay, I will start out uh, just by introducing myself also a little bit in terms of what is my relationship to this thing that we call discourse analysis and what are uh, my aims for what I hope we can get done today. Um, so as Giacomo said, I started out in biochemistry and then I switched over to political science and eventually became an ecological economist who deals with political theory issues. Um, so my relationship to discourse analysis in many respects is in the first instance as a political scientist. Um, that's more or less the style of discussion that I hope we can open up today. But I also hope that we can uh, create some spaces where we think about this in a broader way so that we can also imagine what does discourse analysis mean in a context of ecological economics, in a context of political ecology, and uh, also in a context of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, which is where I would imagine myself being uh, most at home as a political theory uh, thinker. Okay, so um, my objectives for today are rather modest. Um, and if I can manage to impress two points upon you over the course of today, then I will consider my work here to have been done well. Um, those two points are that discourse is something that happens out in the real world, whatever that is, and that interpreting and analyzing discourse requires as much theorizing as does our discussion about the content. So when we think of the idea of discourse analysis, I want to encourage you to keep in your mind two completely separate types of theoretical... Hello. So we had a computer joining us. Welcome, computer. Um, two completely different types of theoretical uh, approaches to your work. And one of those is, what does discourse mean to me? What type of discourse do I want to study and how do I conceptualize and theorize my ideas about discourse? And then at another level, we also need to introduce and make use of some kind of social theory regarding the content of that discourse. And these are fundamentally different types of theory. 
So I also want to talk a little bit about theory, um, and I think we'll do that step by step. But as I said, if nothing else comes across, please let me get this point across, that I think discourse analysis requires that we cope with these two completely different types of theoretical approaches. One to what do we mean by discourse, and the other to what is our explanation of the content inside of that discourse. Keeping in mind that they dialogue with each other, or at least hopefully they should. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'd like to introduce my companions here in this slide. So, uh, what you have over in the top corner here is my institutional affiliations. Uh, so the Humboldt University of Berlin, the Autonomous University in Barcelona, and ICTA. How am I doing with the microphone? Okay, good. Um, and at the bottom, you will see a little photograph of myself and a collaborator of mine named Adam Kulit Ola Muarabu, who is a junior elder of the Il Paracuio Masai in southern Tanzania, who were evicted from the Usangu Plains because their cattle were destroying a Ramsar, candidate Ramsar site. So what do I mean with these images up here in this top corner? These are my institutional affiliations. These are a part of my social identity, and they provide you with information about who has authorized me, who frames and shapes me, and I include Adam and myself there, because I consider a part of my positioning as a scholar and as an academic, not only in terms of my institutional positions with the Humboldt University, affiliated with ICTA and the Autonomous University, but also as a, well, I have a friend who calls me a mercenary. Um, he says, you're an academic mercenary. Um, I suppose I would say that there is an aspect to what I do that is quite independent. So for me, an important part of how I understand my position within academia is that one of the things that I'm doing is I am trying to collaborate with people who perhaps don't already have empowered positions within the academic discourse, and that I choose my subjects not only based on what these two institutions or other funders might tell me are appropriate, but also about what my theory and my ideas tell me are subjects that need and deserve inquiry. Okay. So over here I'd like to show you some of my intellectual companions. And these intellectual companions who accompany me on my journey of inquiry and the work I do are in the top frame there, the garbage pickers. How many of you guys know about garbage picking as a lifestyle? Okay, we're probably a reasonably uh, aware group when it comes to this uh, community of individuals. Um, so in the mega cities of the world, there are also mega garbage dumps, and they tend not to be very well regulated. And in many of these garbage dumps, it's not only the case that people make their living by collecting potentially useful residuals out of those garbage dumps, but they live there. Um, in some cases, these people, and for me this is a really powerful symbol of the kinds of situations we're dealing with here. Um, in some cases, these people's children who are born in the garbage dumps die as a result of the blood poisoning that takes place when the umbilical cord is exposed to the air. So, um, that's, yeah. Absolutely. That was an intervention. Thank you. Um, the next image we have here is a group of campesinos in northern Peru, in a region called Cajamarca. And these individuals are protesting the Conga gold mine. The Conga gold mine uh, is a kind of complicated situation. It was canceled and reinitiated and canceled and reinitiated which is not uncommon for these types of mines. Um, the government of Peru uh, ran on a platform of planning to cancel it and then decided to go ahead with the project. These people live in a pastoralist region 
and they graze their animals at the top of this mountain, and this mountain includes a few lakes. These people are protesting because those lakes will be replaced by synthetic uh, human-made water reservoirs. And so this conflict in many respects is about choices of lifestyle and positions with respect to how one understands one's relationship to one's environment. Um, okay, I, I'll leave it there for now. And then the last photo is a group of uh, indigenous people protesting at the Durban uh, conference of the parties to the International Convention on Climate Change in uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change in 2011. And I don't know if you guys can see here what it says. They have a sign that says, no red. And their position, everybody knows what is red. And if, okay. Um, red is a fascinating artifact that is well worth studying, I think. Um, red stands for... Uh, reduction of emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. Um, Red is, uh, in some respects, a response to the Millennium Development Assessment, in which one of the scientific points that was made was that part of the CO2 problem that we have at the moment is associated with the liberation of sequestered carbon as a consequence of deforestation. And so when we continue along this global project of carbon fetishization and calculating, uh, the deforestation becomes a candidate. So if we can stop deforestation, it becomes a net plus in terms of reduction of carbon emissions. So red has become a sort of a placeholder for a variety of impossible agreements, both in terms of uh, forest management, which never achieved an agreement at Rio. So at Rio, we had agreements about the carbon, we had the Agenda 21 agreement, and we had the biodiversity agreement. But with respect to forests, we only had a discussion and some principles. And with respect to fisheries, it never even got that far, which I think is an interesting point. So what is RED? RED is a program being coordinated by the United Nations that is in the process of being combined with the clean development mechanism that allows the cessation of deforestation, mainly in the tropics, which is where it's happening most rapidly at the moment and where it's got the greatest carbon liberation, as a form of carbon sequestration, so that the programs designed to avoid deforestation can become part of the clean development mechanism type exchange processes, whereby people in the minority world are able to buy carbon sequestration to compensate for their carbon production. So uh, one of the issues, as you might imagine, is that there are many places in these forests where there are still people living. And these people have a different idea of how these short forests should be managed in comparison with what the ideas of RED are. And I think this is a very interesting topic, so I have to be careful not to spend too much time talking about this. If you like to, we can talk about it later. Um, but there, their argument and their protest is about self-determination, that they should have the right to decide how the forests they live in are being managed. So what do all these uh, three groups have in common and why do I call them my companions? These uh, three groups of people fall into the category of what my colleague Ariel Sala calls the meta-industrial subject. And the meta-industrial subject, and specifically meta instead of post or pre, is a political subject who is sequestering and making use of low entropy through their physical interaction with the environment around them. So in this respect, individuals who are not directly dependent upon the technological infrastructure of late industrialization. So their ability to survive on a daily basis depends on their own hands and their own direct use of their physical environment. So 
Uh, the reason I went through all of these things here, and I described to you a bit this slide, is because from my point of view, this is a part of what we can imagine being discourse analysis. So we are here involved in a discourse, I hope because I am not a fan of the banking model of education, as Paulo Freire names it. I would much prefer that we have the opportunity to imagine things together and that you will have some thoughts of your own during the course of the time we spend together. And so this is an opportunity for me to present myself as a participant within our discourse and also to illustrate for you one of the basic principles that I think we always need to make use of and keep in mind when we're doing discourse analysis. And that's the relationship between the individual as a political subject and the structure of the systems within which they're embedded. So when we imagine that we are going to do an analysis of discourse, discourse can be understood as something that arises between individuals within social contexts. In that respect, it doesn't make any sense to talk about discourse without thinking about the characteristics of the individuals. And it also doesn't make any sense to talk about discourse without thinking about the characteristics of the social context within which they're embedded. Okay, so I have, to, I have two different computers here, so, because I can't look at you if I'm looking at that. So, here we go. And one more here. I, I would love to go around the room and find out who are all of you, but I expect we don't have time for that. So, we'll see if we can find some time for it later. Um, okay, the next question that we need to ask, naturally, is then what is discourse? So, if I'm going to analyze something, what is it? I don't expect in the time that we have together today that we can resolve this question. What I hope is to give you some ideas about how you can think about these things. Um, one day to talk about discourse analysis is enough to tease you and give you some ideas about the topics you need to think about. Uh, it's not uh, enough time for us to really uh, provide you with the tools that you need in order to carry out this work. So my hope is that I can lay out for you some of the options, and you can make some choices about which kinds of tools appear to be the ones that can work for the types of studies that you're thinking about conducting. So, yeah, if we are going to study discourse, we need to imagine what is it. Uh, is it utterances? Is it understanding? Is it argument? Is it meaning? The answers to these questions can be, and I don't mean to suggest that this is correct, uh, this is a category assignment, which I think is an inevitable part of doing analysis, but I don't mean to suggest that these categories are correct, just that they perhaps are helpful for today's discussion, can be distinguished into a modernist and a postmodernist uh, conception. And here we can take two classic archetypes to help us think through what that means, uh, Habermas and Foucault. That's okay. Sorry, we have to take that out of the recording, sorry. Um, so we can think about Habermas and Foucault, and we can ask ourselves, how do these two individuals get involved in the discussion? What I just realized is that in the final version of my edit, I seem to have uh, taken out my slides uh, where I wanted to talk about Geertz and Weber. So before I go on to Habermas and Foucault, I would like to talk with you a little bit about Geertz and Weber. Um, but I think it's appropriate with this slide up there. Um, so how many of you are familiar with the sociologist Max Weber or have ever heard of his work? Okay. I would like to suggest that Weber is one of the first uh, thinkers who gives us a, a concrete way of thinking about the challenges associated with discourse analysis. Discourse analysis is dirty work. And one of the reasons I think that discourse analysis is dirty work is because we are using us as observers of something that we participate in on a regular basis. So this problem that Weber began to discuss at the turn of the century with respect to how to achieve objectivity in social science is absolutely critical 
to being able to produce any kind of useful results in a discourse analysis. How one chooses to cope with this dilemma, I think, is a style choice to a certain degree. I think the only thing that can be really called an error in discourse analysis is to fail to think about this dilemma. So when I say this dilemma, what I mean is the dilemma that I am using my socially constructed, historicized perceptions to read what is going on inside of socially constructed, historicized situations that I want to observe. So what might be some of the consequences of that? This is a question. So I'm hoping that perhaps you have some answers. Oh, we have a second mic, we can pass it around. Then you can all suffer with the intervention of the technological object that is obstructing my ability to interact with you. <laughs> Okay, so what you're saying, one risk that we have is that if we don't see the way in which my interpretations are influencing. Yeah, how mm -hmm. I, uh, the researcher as, a, as a observer is interpreting... Oh, <laughs> yeah, how they, we mutually constitute each other in our work as researcher. Mm -hmm. and res as researchers, the, the objects of our research um, are not just something out there. We, we are s putting stuff into it. So mm -hmm. it's, if, if we don't address this question, if we don't ad it's like we don't admit to our own bias, to the fact that I'm wearing certain glasses, mm -hmm. my theoretical glasses, and I see the world mm -hmm. not as it is, but as I see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what could be the consequence of that? Why, why would it be a problem from a research point of view? Um, the problem of bias, the problem of thinking that that you that there is something out there without no connection to our own influence. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anybody have but, any ideas? What are the concrete characteristics of the problem of bias, as it's been described here? I think that. Uh, researchers with different enculturization or socialization processes will make different conclusions or different analysis mm -hmm. discourses and then it could be a problem. We, we can mm -hmm. say, oh, this is a dilemma. I think that you, mm -hmm. are, you are going to... Mm -hmm. And why would it be a problem? Well, I think the problem uh, comes with because some researchers, uh, some, some uh, narrative uh, are are used by, by the people that have power mm -hmm. to say that science is telling me that I, am, I have the truth. Mm -hmm. Then it's like using science, like, like impose power more in, in, we can say, sophisticated uh, via, we can say. Mm -hmm. way. Okay, so one risk of not formalizing this problem and asking myself as a researcher, how am I going to empirically cope with the reality that I am a socially constructed, historicized actor trying to study a socially constructed, historicized object? One consequence of not formally taking the time to look at that may be this type of bias where I don't look at how there's this interplay between my perceptions and the perceptions of the people I'm studying. And one consequence of that could be that I am instrumentalized, if I'm hearing you correctly. So that I become, and certainly in the context of political ecology or my uh, mercenary science, um, being instrumentalized would be a great concern for me. So this is certainly one of the issues we could imagine. I would suggest there's at least one other one that we would want to be concerned about as scholars. My interpretation of, of what he said was the fact that um, we 
if we are not aware of our bias, we, we don't um, realize that we exclude other <coughs> perspectives. And mm -hmm. in that way, I as a researcher, mm -hmm. uh, we are doing something unethical. But okay. it's interesting, I never thought of what's the problem of bias. It's mm. a problem. <laughs> Why do I have to think about what's the problem of bias when my problem is how is it that some researchers are still pretending that they're objective mm -hmm. in that <laughs> sense of not having bias? Yes. So thank you for... Yeah, well, I think um, we, we do have to unpack it a little bit and ask ourselves well, what, are, what are the operational problems associated with bias? But before you give away the mic, I want to uh, try and tease out this second point you've made because I think it's related to where I'm hoping we can get here. Uh, so you said, well, I want to include um, all the right people or I want to have everybody involved. Um, it's unethical if I don't. But of course, if I'm studying an empirical object, especially if I'm doing a PhD, it's utterly impossible for me to include all of the relevant perspectives. That's, our, that's the institutional expectation, actually, to include all the possible actors and all the possible perspectives. But um, in the same time, this kind of inclusion of everybody would, will also mean some sort of exclusion. Because it's like you are forced not to focus on the marginalized, the ones mm -hmm. that are usually not in depth looked for. I don't know, that's mm -hmm. just my interpretation. I, I think it's a, if you have thought about this, then, then I've already finished my work here, so the rest is just icy. Um, because for me, these are absolutely critical questions we have to ask before we begin trying to do discourse analysis, before we even set out to start collecting the data. Because my frames, who I am, my personal history, my cultural framings, they are going to dictate what appears to me to be an appropriate collection object. And so if I don't begin this work beforehand, and that's why I gave you Geertz as this first text to have a look at, then I can be absolutely assured that I'm going to be performing all kinds of collection patterns that are consistent with how I have been built instead of what I have formulated as a research topic. And so this is where I wanted to get to with it. The other potential problem that we have if we aren't careful about recognizing the structure of our biases to the best of our ability is that we may fail to describe correctly the problem that we want to study. Well, but then again, I have to admit, I already finished my PhD uh -huh. with Michael Shapiro and I'm a lot, a lot of practices and timely spatial and discourse analysis. So uh -huh. maybe that's why, but uh, in the same time, I, it's still a lot of uh, institutional pressure to make your research as accurate as possible. And some, some many times mm -hmm. discourse analysis sounds like some, some, something that is too fluid to be rigorously and accurately considered research. Mm -hmm. that's, my, that's what uh -huh. I'm fighting okay. with. Michael Shapiro, the democratic theorist. He considers himself critical theorists. <laughs> well, but, uh, I would hope that the critical theorists are democratic theorists. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. Hating democracy in a rancier way. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, there we go. So, um, well, that's a little artifact of a thing that we encounter in discourses, which is that there's probably a lot of people who have no idea what <laughs> that little conversation was about. But we're going to come to that later. Okay, um, what I wanted to unpack here with this point about Weber and Goetz, uh, Goetz is that we have this problem of the, the relationship between our study object. We have a problem of perspective. So in the first instance, I would argue that we must problematize this. We must think about it and we must ask ourselves, how do we understand our relationship? So how many people here are studying a culture other than their own? Yeah. Okay, and how much time have you invested in working through and trying to understand what that means when you want to conduct analysis of what's going on inside that culture? Is that something to which you've given formal theory time? No. I would recommend, if you want to do discourse analysis, that you need to do that. Um, I would recommend that you do it anyway. Uh, but I think... Um, in the context of conducting an analysis of the discourses taking place within that society, we have this problem that Geertz talks about in terms of interpretation. 
So there are two levels to this interpretation problem. And I think um, we can, to a certain degree, allocate Habermas and Foucault to two sides of those levels. So one level of the interpretation problem that Gibbs is talking about is that there may be intentions inside of an action that I cannot interpret because I don't have enough information about the symbolism of that culture. So there are some societies in which nodding means yes, and there are some societies in which nodding means no. So if I do not know that I am in a society where nodding means no, then I am going to have a problem. So to a certain degree, it's necessary to do some ethnographical or at least some general scientific scoping of the culture and the society that you want to study if you're going to be studying a society that is not your own. And I would put this on the Habermas side of things. And the reason I would put this on the Habermas side of things is because Habermas is generally looking at discourse as about intentional utterances and is presuming in a Kantian line of thinking that those intentional utterances have meaning and in a way constitute in a discursive forum a truth about how that society understands itself, which then is related to being able to understand how that society goes about behaving. So Habermas has what I would refer to as a correspondence theory of the structure of truth. Habermas is working on the basis that there are intentions behind statements and that the relationship between those intentions and the discourse is what's important to be able to identify and uncover. The other type of issue that we can have is that there are things going on in the discourse that the individuals involved in the discourse do not fully understand. So that there are things occurring at the level of the emergent property of the social structures that are not the intention of any given actor within the discourse, but nonetheless have very important rhetorical force and in many ways may be regulating what it's possible to say, what it's not possible to say, and how the self-understanding of that society is operating. And I would place these then onto the Foucauldian side. And so in the text you have from Geertz, he talks about the first in terms of misunderstanding what was meant to be done, but there's also a second layer of misunderstanding that can develop when I begin to interpret reactions between individuals. So a boy is winking, another boy doesn't understand it's a wink, a boy is twitching, another boy doesn't understand it's a twitch, and eventually you have a chain reaction of behaviors taking place that may have very little to do with the intentions of any of the actors involved. Okay. So as I said, I thought I could touch a bit on the Weber and Geertz while also looking at this slide, but now I want to go down to this list. And I hope that this list is not complete and that you can think about this list in terms of your own research. Um, and I hope that we'll get a chance to talk a bit about what these things mean to those of you who are thinking about doing discourse analysis. Okay, so I have suggested that Habermas and Foucault can be understood as archetypical champions of the modernist and the postmodernist approaches to the analysis of discourse. And in many respects, they are looking at the same objects, but they have different ideas about what is discourse. So for Habermas, intentionality is absolutely vital. However, he takes the position or presumes that in the act of making a statement, I am somehow claiming its truth validity. Also for Habermas, very important is argument and rationality. So connected with this idea of intent is a particular presumption about how communication operates. The, within a Foucauldian frame, it would not say that Foucault is not interested in intentionality. 
And I think that would be a mistaken interpretation of his work. However, Foucault is working on the basis that intentionality and the way in which an individual participates in a discourse may not be one-to-one. -one. So it may very well be the case that my intentions about how I want to participate in a discourse are inconsistent with the way in which my participation in the discourse actually operates. And that this is relevant and that that constitutes a part of my participation in the discourse. Again, to balance out a bit, Habermas would not disregard these kinds of problems, but he would consider them to be problems. So he would be interested in trying to see how were people silenced? What are the obstructions within the discourse that are making it impossible for somebody to speak? And the main study object would be to try and understand what they really meant to say. Whereas on the other side, from a postmodernist orientation, one could say, I consider the accidental things that individuals were forced into saying by their physical and social environment to also be relevant study objects. Okay. Um, with respect to utterances, Habermas is very strict. And for Habermas, the only thing that counts in the discourse is the discourse. So utterances are things said by people, perhaps at a stretch, we can talk about statements being made by institutions, although I think basically Habermas would prefer not to include them. But we can talk about formal political statements and policy documents. For Foucault, utterances can include physical spaces, bodily restrictions, social norms that mediate how I am expected to be dressing, this microphone. So the idea and the space of what counts as a discursive intervention is very different. And I think this is a, one of the most important distinctions when one's asking oneself, do I want to do a modernist discourse analysis, or do I want to do a postmodernist discourse analysis? Who do I think are the relevant actors? So, for example, if we think about the Conga mine case that I had mentioned at the beginning, the analysis that I've been doing at the moment with a student from Peru on this case is very Habermasian. We're not talking about the place of the mountain. Um, we're talking much more about the understanding that the individuals have about the place of the mountain. So everything that we're talking about is embedded within an understanding of the individuals. And we're looking at the things that they are saying. However, if I wanted to have a more postmodernist approach, I could talk about the ways in which the mountain or the ways in which the Andes restrict people getting involved in exploitation. Why is it violent that the mining that takes place in the Andes is violent. It's violent in Madre de Dios, where they're using water cannons at the moment to take the silt-based gold out of the ground. And it's violent in the open cast mines. To what degree is the violence of the Andes, the difficulties associated with coming into this space related to the violence of extracting the gold, for example? So in this respect, I might imagine the physical landscaping, the physical landscape having an utterance. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is to just uh, walk through a little bit some of the basic ideas that Habermas and Foucault use. Um, please don't think that after you look at this slide, you know what Habermas is talking about. Um, or that after you look at the next one, you know what Foucault is talking about. Um, Habermas and Foucault wrote a lot, both of them. And they are very difficult thinkers, and I would not claim to really know what either of them are talking about. <laughs> However, I do think that there are some basic points that we can tease out for the purpose of our discussion here. What I'm hoping to do is to invite you to imagine which of these styles appears to fit better with what you would like to do with discourse analysis in your work in the event that you want to use discourse analysis. 
because maybe it's not the right tool for you. Okay. So as I said before, Habermas is very concerned about intentionality. So for him, intention and what, it, what people mean to be saying in the discourse is very important. Uh, he's interested in the social structures and the intentional actors and their utterances. And in this respect, the actual things that are said. So articulated and constructed self-understanding of the actors. Oh, I've not gone to the next. I see that's what happens. This is the slide that you're not supposed to believe tells you everything about Habermas. Sorry. Um, so he's interested in the articulated and constructed self-understanding of the actors. And from his point of view, it's this that constitutes discourse. So we immediately have this very big Weberian problem of how am I going to have this self-understanding? So one thing I would also say is if you decide that the approach you want to take is more of a Habermasian one, which I think is totally acceptable inside of a political ecology uh, study frame, um, I would recommend that you read Weber because Weber will help you to understand what you can and cannot get away with and how to manage that space. That being said, there are a lot of people in my experience who read Weber as arguing for objectivity. I read Weber as arguing for awareness of inobjectivity. However, Weber does have what I would call, again, this correspondence theory of the structure of truth. So there is a presumption that by managing my bias, I can reduce its impact on the quality of the data that I produce. And why is that important? That's important because what I want to find is the self-understanding of the actors. So my understanding of the actors is not what's important in a Habermasian frame or in a modernist frame. What's relevant to me is what do these people think is happening. So this object that I want to study from a discourse analysis point of view is not how I'm writing theory onto them, but what are they trying to produce themselves inside of the discourse. So it's presumed that the discourse is rational. Irrational interventions are left out of the study. So we don't talk about war, although some might argue that it's rational. Uh, we don't talk about violent acts. We don't talk about crying and screaming fits and temper tantrums. And we don't talk about aesthetics and art. We talk about social systems and social structures and intentional statements and reasonable argument. Okay, on the other side, we could think, for example, about Foucault. So moments, oh, sorry, I have to go to the next slide here too as well. Yeah. Thank you for your patience with my techno space here. Um, we can think about moments of meaning assignment with or without intention being what constitutes discourse. So there is this thing called meaning and somehow meaning gets given. And that those moments of meaning assignment, wherever they might come, can in various ways be interpreted or understood as a part of a discourse. So we have several moments of meaning assignment that have nothing to do with utterances, as they would be understood in a Habermasian sense, regulating the shape and the structure of our discourse here right now. Does anybody have any thoughts about what they might be? I mean here now, in this room. Absolutely. Yeah, and from my point of view, from a discourse analysis point of view, if you want to take a postmodernist position, if you want to discuss these things, then we must talk about these things. So, I have a colleague uh, based here at ICTA, Mario Giampetro, and uh, one of my favorite, he's, a, he's very good for little wisdoms, but one of my favorite little wisdoms from Mario is never underestimate the usefulness of stating the incredibly obvious. Yes. <laughs> 
And can you can you explain what you mean in terms of the seating arrangement, or you are speaking in terms of uh, some of the social context that's brought us together in this room? Yeah, uh, because uh -huh. we, we have different social contexts, culture, uh -huh. perceptions, motivations, yeah. knowledge, and when if we work together, for example, in groups or mm -hmm. if we express different uh, positions, mm -hmm. so it's a power file mm -hmm. also, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I like this, this point because I think it gives us an opportunity to, to think again about this distinction. So this distinction between my personal history and my motivation, which has to do with my intentions, and then the things that are accidentally happening to me. So it was not my intention that I should be up here and you guys all down there. But this is what happened to me. Um, so we can think about these two differences, and there is a degree of fluidity between them. So the intentions exist in a way that's shaped by these conditions. And again, I know it's a bit of a cop-out, but categories don't exist in the real world. We assign them. And so I have a tendency to always be looking at the relationship between whichever categories we're talking about. But I think particularly with discourse analysis, it's really important that we, we give that attention. Maybe uh, thinking of moments of meaning assignment would be also um, thinking of the conditions that created the possibilities for certain things to happen or certain things to exist as well. Are you all thinking about that too? Like what's happening that makes something possible as a meaning, as to be recognized as some meaning? That's one thing I want to ask you. But then, like, I need to go back a little bit to, Fuc to Habermas, in a way, because I was a little blocked when you said that we can operate with a Habermasian, like, modernist uh, perspective to study, for example, cultures like the, the ones in Peru. Mm -hmm. For me, modernity comes with rationality. Rationality comes with violence. How can we use modernity framework to understand people who are not normally using the enlightenment, you know, the rational, technological, scientific language of modernity? Mm -hmm. That's just my question because mm -hmm. I, uh, I avoided the Habermasian kind of uh, discourse <laughs> analysis. It's a fair point. Um, what I would say is I used to be a lot more against Habermas than I am today. Um, I'm still not somebody who uses Habermasian discourse analysis, as you probably already noticed by my dialogue with my microphone. I'm a bit more on the objects are involved in my world uh, side of the, the fence, as it were. Um, however, I think one of the things that's important to distinguish between these two approaches is the question of whether or not what's relevant to me is the intentions inside that discursive community. And as I've gone through the painstaking and tedious work of reading Habermas, um, which is painstaking and tedious because he's really dry, and he's read a lot of stuff, um, one of the things that's become, one of the positions that I have developed, I suppose I would say, is that I think that Habermas has a lot more flexibility when it comes to the rules of discursive engagement than we might give him credit for at the beginning. And what I mean by that in terms of using discourse analysis either from a Habermasian modernist point of view or from a postmodernist point of view is that I think the choice about which way we do that in many respects needs to be informed by what we want to study. So the individuals who live in the Cajamarca region in the north of Peru where this mine has been proposed are mestizo, um, post-colonial peasants. Um, and they have been very, very clear in their utterances. So they are involved in direct action engagement where they have occupied the area, they have been involved in violent conflict, in this situation, 
And they have made a large number of very explicit statements about what they find unacceptable about the development of this mind. So in that respect, I think the, the question of whether I would use a Habermasian approach or a Foucauldian approach to try and understand what's going on there depends on what it is that I want to talk about. So if what I want to talk about as a scholar is why the mind is going ahead or why is the mind not going ahead, if I want to try and explain the overall dynamics of what's going on in politics in Peru at the moment, the government of Peru has the final power to decide if this mine will happen or not. And the government of Peru has clearly demonstrated that it has no problem with violently removing these peasants in the event that that's what it sees as being necessary. So I think in this context, everybody is being very clear about their utterances about the conflict. So there is that body of available data in the form of these modern intentional statements. So one way that we can study what's going on there is a very ordinary conventional discussion about the power relations based on who has what kind of power in the social structure and what it is that they have said that they want to do. Uh, I don't think that that particular conflict is one where there's a lot of um, where there's a lot of secondary rewriting of people's positions. Um, there are issues about subsidies for the agriculture. There are issues about the area. The area is also a catchment for the Amazon. Um, I don't mean to suggest it's not complicated. I don't know if this uh, speaks to your comment, but I think it's a really important comment. Okay. And, uh, I, I think that it's important to ask ourselves, which tool am I going to use? Not just on the basis of, of which tools do I think I'm supposed to use? Uh, or am I one of these or am I one of those? But also to ask ourselves that question based on what do we think are the characteristics of the object that we want to study? Okay. Um, we have a coffee break planned at some stage, don't we? What time? Sorry? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. How are we doing? Everybody still with me? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's hard. I mean, it's one of the consequences of the banking uh, geography is that I do all the talking and you guys just kind of have to sit there. If you, were, if you had to talk more, you'd be, it's easier to stay awake. Trust me. <laughs> okay, where were we? Um, yeah, well, it's a nice next point because I would say I, I don't think that Foucault is leaving out these things that Habermas wants to talk about. And, and I try to use them together, which I've been told you're not allowed to do. Uh, but I, I think it can be done. Um, but what, what Foucault adds on to that is these unintentional acts. And he, he says we must think about these unintentional acts. I think another thing that Foucault adds on, which is a bit more complicated and a bit more difficult for us to discuss in the time we have at our disposal, is this idea that the discourse is not necessarily going anywhere. Habermas presumes that the discourse is going somewhere. And where it came from and what it's trying to say are important study objects from a modernist point of view. And again, this is part of what I mean about the Conga case, to understand what are the different individuals trying to say. I think the, the campesinos are trying to say, I have a right to live here. The campesinos are also trying to say a man-made or a human-made reservoir is not my lagoon. So there are, there are real places where the discussion is going. And the government is saying, shut up and go away. And the Canadian mining companies are saying, we don't care about you. I just want the gold. And the investors who are involved in buying that gold are saying, I've never heard of Conga and I'm worried about financial security. So there are statements there. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, this idea that it's going somewhere or as opposed to not going somewhere. 
And the main difference is that discourses are not reducible to intentions and to utterances, that we can include other objects, that we include history, that we include different ways in which behaviors of oppression or violence have influenced perception. Okay. Um, I'd also like to just uh, unpack a little bit another option for you, because I think my job here is to give you some options, not to give you answers, because as I said, our time is really short to get training in how to do any of these things. What I can do is tease you a bit about the options, and then as researchers, you can get involved in figuring out how to do it. So, uh, I would suggest that Bruno Latour is also uh, part of, and a very good representation of this postmodernist side of discourse analysis. However, his work would not typically be categorized as discourse analysis, and you want to be careful if you decide to pick up this tool, because it's uh, barbed and sticky and hard to use. So the microphone's back? Am I good? Okay. So as I was saying, sometimes objects intervene in our lives and regulate our discursive potential in ways that we hadn't anticipated. Um, sorry, that was just like a really geeky ant joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can see that it didn't go over very well. Okay. So um, Bruno Latour is very well known for this idea of actor network theory. Um, but I think, uh, and I would recommend to anybody who's thinking about using ANT, um, if you're thinking about using actor network theory, be very careful and make sure that you read Bruno Latour's first book, which is called Laboratory Life. This is an ethnographic study of the Salk Institute in California, where he's watching physical scientists go about conducting their daily work as study objects. And I am convinced that it's impossible to really grasp and make good use of what Latour says later if you haven't read this book, because he does not do a very good job of explaining where his ideas have come from in later texts. He sort of fires off into the mist. Um, the, the reason I wanted to put Latour here is because of this idea of the inscription of truth. But as I was saying, if you choose this as a tool, you need to be careful because there are a lot of people who don't recognize this as a tool in discourse analysis, and I think you would want to complement it with other things. Um, but as I said, I want to give you some options. So the idea of the inscription of truth is embedded in Latour's work in the Salk Laboratory, where he was observing scientists involved in producing analysis of diseases and medications and treatments. And to cut a long story short and do a vulgar injustice to a beautiful book that I recommend you read, um, I think one of the interpretations we can take out of that text and can read into the rest of Latour's work is this idea that there is a real thing called truth that is a social construct. And in this way, I think it exists as a bit of a bridging position between Habermas and Foucault. So he presumes that there's a fluidity between human and non-human interlocutors, like my microphone or our desks or airplanes. And he proposes in his later work that we can conduct studies of how society is operating, and I don't think that Latour would describe himself as doing discourse analysis, um, through the actions and behaviors also being treated as these kinds of utterances. That that which constitutes a intervention in a social process is not restricted to what I say, but it's also restricted to what I do, it's also restricted to the physical space in which I find myself, and for Latour, and of course that's already recognized within behavioral sciences and within psychology, um, but for Latour it goes one step further because this microphone also has a type of agency, which we saw quite nicely demonstrated by how effectively it rendered me silent. 
So instead of imagining that there's this intentionality that's determining what's going on, I would say Latour suggests to us that a combination of intentions and unintentions produce what's going on. And in this way, I think he's quite close to Foucault. He's also interested not only in the intentional utterances, but also in the reactions to those utterances. So in what way is what it might be possible for me to intend regulated by what I've encountered from you? So to what extent is a protest or a response only a reiteration of an oppressive assertion? So I have a colleague, Ingo von Bluthorn, a sociologist who talks about what he calls the post-ecologist politics and using a wide array of very complicated German and French philosophers, he develops a very complicated position, which I think is beautiful, don't get me wrong, um, arguing that uh, the idea of the catastrophe of the environmental crisis is itself a response in some ways to the idea that we don't have a crisis. And that our understanding of to what extent we have real concrete environmental problems or not is not necessarily informed entirely by our own understanding of what looks like a problem on the ground. Well, we don't live in the garbage pits outside of Rio de Janeiro. We live here, and it's nice here. Uh, in Barcelona, the, water, the air is not so good, but generally it's not so bad. And what uh, Ingo von Blunhard suggests is that to a certain degree there's a reaction associated with this idea of the environmental crisis as a way to produce crisis in a world where the system has become inaccessible. So I think for Lantour, this idea of the way in which reactions are responses is a very important part of interpretation. And then he proposes that a discourse is an inter-object rapport. So that again, discourse is not something that is produced, but it's something that happens. And why do I consider this to be discourse? Because as we were discussing at the beginning, or as I was telling you, since we're not having a discussion, since I'm up here and you're down there, um, Discourse, I believe, is about creating meaning. So if objects and reactions to objects can produce meaning, then we need to include that inter-object rapport. And there's a huge body of literature, mostly in the science and technology studies discourse, but expanding out uh, to a certain degree used in um, human geography discourses and archaeology discourses more recently about aqua network theory, if you're interested in thinking about that. So I'm gonna go through a couple more slides just to finish off this framing, and then I guess we take a coffee break. Yeah? Mm, good question. Yeah, yeah um, I take the word utterance from Habermas. Um, and it means in the most specific way, the, the actual saying of something. So it's a, a very simple idea. So we might imagine if I am mute and I can't speak, can I utter? So can I produce sounds? So in that respect, speaking in sign language can be an utterance. So if we start from a Habermasian position, Habermas says that we understand what people mean by listening to their utterances. This is why it's difficult to understand somebody who's speaking in a different language. So to what degree are the things said by someone in a, in a language I don't understand to me utterances? Does that make sense? Okay, no, thank you for asking. Are there other questions like that? Things I'm bouncing over that 
I'm using that you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so as I said, I, I suggest I just go through two more slides and then we take the break and then we'll sort of shift gears and start thinking about some uh, illustrative uh, things that uh, can start giving you ideas for what we'll be doing this afternoon. Okay. So um, if we pick up on Foucault, I think another direction in which we can take Foucault is the work that was done by Martin Haya. Uh, Martin Haya has written a very important book called The Politics of Environmental Discourse. Um, if you're looking for an easy way to use Foucault without reading Foucault, I recommend you use Haya. Um, however, I also recommend that you keep in mind that Haya is talking about ecological modernization and that in many respects, the consensus and coalition building positions that higher studies and the characteristics of the objects that he's working with have a kind of a modernist basis in them that I think uh, produces some problems. Um, but we don't need to go into that in much detail. I think you will discover your own problems and how to solve them if you pick him up and decide to use him. Uh, but I definitely would recommend him if you don't want to read everything from Foucault. Uh, okay, so starting with this definition from Foucault, we can kind of see this relationship and this link. So Foucault talks about this idea of disciplines. And he has a lot written on what is discipline and how does it work and in, yeah five minutes okay and how does it regulate uh, how we behave and what we can do so when he talks about discursive formulations he says disciplines sets of rules govern their objects the form of, disper of dispersion that regularly divides up what they say and the system of the referentials so what he's proposing here is that disciplines, regulated ways of thinking, rules about what we are allowed to do or what we are not allowed to do, social norms as Habermas would describe them, create this potential regulation. So it's not only a question of what do I utter, but we also need to start asking ourselves questions about what have I been unable to utter as a consequence of the way in which I have been shaped and regulated and formulated, not only to the point of being prohibited from uttering it, but for, to the point of having been framed in my epistemological approach to the world to be incapable of imagining having uttered it. Okay. And if we want to take that and transpose it into something that's a bit more policy, science-oriented, ready to hand, we can think about this definition from Hayer. So Hayer describes a discourse as a specific ensemble of ideas, concepts, and categorizations that are produced, reproduced, and transformed in a particular set of practices and through which meaning is given to physical and social realities. This is a much more concrete and workable definition, but I think ostensibly, in, in principle, talking about much the same thing. Uh, it's worth noting that higher is now in the government in the Netherlands, so um, acceptable in many ways. Okay, so this is the last slide I want to touch on before we go to the break. Um, When we ask ourselves, what do we include or what do we not include as an utterance? Uh, when we ask ourselves, what is the discourse that I want to study and why? I think we need to reflect on the characteristics of the conditions that we consider to be important study objects. So we are all studying something that we have identified as a study object for some reason. And I think if we don't reflect on that, 
then we cannot produce a good discourse analysis because discourse doesn't exist out there somewhere. We have to choose and bound what we're gonna study. So this is one of the discourses that I study. Um, this is an image of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima. And this uh, utterance up at the top is from a physical scientist who was involved in the Manhattan Project. So this physical scientist who was involved in the Manhattan Project was telling a friend of his, who is Stephen Jay Gould, or was, uh, about his experiences in the lab. And uh, Stephen Jay Gould has a wonderful book called The Hedgehog, the Fox, and the Mas Magister's Pox, which is about uh, history of science, which I would definitely recommend you read if you find this topic relevant. Anyway, the physicists who were involved in producing the bomb were locked up in a bunker with a bunch of military guys. And as you can imagine, a bunch of physicists from the 1940s, yeah, uh, locked up with a bunch of 40s military guys with a kind of water oil mix going on. And apparently they called the military guys the bastards. And this utterance is from one of those physicists after he watched the bomb go off in the first tests in the Midwest. And he said, we're all bastards now. And for me, this is an incredibly powerful utterance. And this is the kind of an utterance that I think is the basis for starting to talk about discourse analysis. Uh, from an ant point of view, you could take this actor and you could start tracing his relationships to everything around him. Although the ant people like to take objects as actors. They seem not to like that you would have a human actor. Um, so for here in this particular panel, what I want to raise to your attention is the idea of the relationship between the different type of study objects. So here we have an individual utterance from one person. Then we have these recorded documentations of the real happening. So the social and physical context within which this situation has taken place. We have a historicizing of what was going on. So we have a record of what this was, when did it happen, what is its social and its historical context. And then I have this reflection here about its implications. And this is a comment from Eisenhower. This is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the other quote, the same speech in which he has the famous statement, beware of the military industrial complex, which is uh, better known than this excerpt. Um, but in this particular context, what I'm trying to do in this slide and what I try to do in my study of this discursive space is to link together these different types of utterances. So Eisenhower's comment about this intervention of scientific knowledge production into real politics, I don't think can be meaningfully interpreted as a statement with intent or without, unless one places it in the concept, context of thinking about the fact that this man was in the military and was one of these bastards at the time when the bomb was being developed. So I guess that's a good spot to leave it at for our break. So as I said, uh, please help me if um, what I'm saying is not compatible with what you see up there and I forget to, because I have to push both buttons to keep track of what we're doing. Um, okay, so, um, so far what we've done, I hope, is we have taken a bit of a walk around the the scope and the idea of discourse analysis, thought a bit about what is it and what is discourse and what's involved in trying to study a discourse uh, from a conceptual point of view. And now I want to shift to a more practical level. Uh, I hope that we'll spend this hour then, or more or less an hour, talking about that. And then before uh, we go into the uh, groups, uh, we can have a bit of discussion time perhaps about how you understand these things with relation to your own work. And then we'll go through the exercise of um, trying to get our hands on how this works in applied contexts by looking at the IPBES as a discourse.
and asking, well, what kinds of objects would I pick out? How would I want to think about the structures? Who are the actors I want to include in a study? And in what ways might I think about studying this object? So before we get to the applied level of thinking about studying an object, I want to uh, go through some more concrete uh, points about what it means to undertake this kind of a study. So, um, as I said before, if there's only one thing that you take away from my talk, I hope that it's this one, um, that there are two distinct levels of theory that we need to take into account if we want to undertake a discourse analysis. And one of those levels of theory is theory concerning what is a discourse and how it can be observed. Hmm? Ah, thank you. Yeah, that's why I said you need to help me. <laughs> because I hit the button, but it didn't click. <clears throat> so one is a theory concerning what is discourse and how is it possible to observe discourse. So in this respect, uh, questions of ontology and questions of epistemology. In addition to that, there's the theory concerning the study object itself. Uh, what is your line of inquiry and how are you formulating your approach? I don't think that it's possible to discuss a discourse without having a position with regard to the theory concerning the object itself. And I would say if one thinks that one doesn't have a theory concerning the object itself, then one is simply writing forward theories written by other people in an unreflexive way uh, that is not a benefit to one's own work or to the general discourse. Um, so with respect to this second point, uh, I have this uh, quote from my first teacher of political science, which I like very much. Um, if you are not talking about something, you cannot say anything. So once we've identified what's the discursive space in which we want to conduct an inquiry, I think it's absolutely crucial that we identify what is this thing about which we intend to be talking. So, what? Yeah. So what this implies is that we need to in some way identify reference points. So we've said already that there's the reference point of the self-understanding of the society, or in a postmodernist orientation, we can say that the reference point is this emergent objects generated through the contestation and the reaction and dialogue taking place within objects or between objects. <clears throat> but at some stage, we need to be very clear about what is the ontology of the object that we aim to study. We need to be clear about its composition, its characteristics, the components and the character of the relationships between them. And I think failing to be careful about the ontology means that the discourse analysis will be blurry and it won't have an important or useful insight at the end. And I think that it's not worth the time to conduct inquiry if we don't end up with some useful insights at the end, as we were just discussing over the coffee break. Um, so the other thing that one needs to think about, and I think this is uh, fundamentally related to whether I'm going to use a modernist or a postmodernist approach, or whose theory I would use, is what aspects of the discourse does one wish to study? Uh, is one interested in studying the points of conflict? Is, is that aspect of the discourse in which I want to become involved in observation the points where there is not consensus or the points where there is consensus. These points shape differently and I am probably not going to have enough time to study both of them. So the way in which I'm going to formulate my questions, the way in which I'm going to conduct my inquiry needs to be based on whether or not I'm looking at conflict, whether or not I'm looking at consensus and what particularly are the characteristics or the objects within the discourse that I consider to be relevant. And then I think it's also critical to ask oneself what social theory might help to structure the analysis of the content. So we can talk about the discourse, we can talk about the utterances, but in some way we need to also talk about explaining the social processes that are taking place. So is it social theory based on structural functionalism? 
Is it social theory based on historical materialism? Is it social theory based on behavioral psychology? What is my idea of the way in which it's possible to explain the content of that discourse? Okay. So once these kinds of decisions have been taken about the ontology, about the epistemology, once I've identified what do I consider to be a discourse and whether I want to approach it from a modernist or a postmodernist point of view, then the next thing that I need to start thinking about is the nuts and bolts of how I will collect the material in order to conduct a discourse analysis. So there are lots of conventional tools that we can imagine being the data sources. Uh, one characteristic of discourse analysis is that I'm interested in what people say, or I'm interested in what things say, or what meaning creation is going on. And so that means that there are some basic components of what I will study and look at that are necessary. Uh, I can look at periodicals, I can look at public discourses. I may, if I have a more open idea of what counts as an utterance, be interested in looking at performance art, look at visual representations. I may imagine, for example, that a study of commercial advertisement is relevant, the ways in which movies are produced. Uh, I also now, today, may be interested in looking at how things happen on the internet, and in particular the IPBS uh, case that we're going to look at this afternoon. I've given you just their internet website to look at. And so I think that's a completely suitable starting point. Um, I might also look at legal um, protocol documents where there are formal official types of statements being made or formal political statements, looking at what's happening in the official political dialogue. And then I also might be involved in conducting interviews. So I may say I want to extract information about the discourse by asking people what has been their involvement in it up until now. Another piece of what needs to be included, which is a different type of data, and I would say is more about the background and the producing of one's ontology, is the history of the case that one is studying. So you'll recall I asked before how many people are studying a culture of which they are a part. So if I'm studying a culture that I'm not embedded within, that I don't have a cultural background, then I have to do some initial study of that just to begin with. In addition, I think regardless of whether one is a part of the culture one's studying or not, it's really important to come up with some understanding of where the discourse that you want to study sits within that society. Where does it sit historically, perhaps? That's always important to me. But you may also ask, where does it sit socially? Is this a discourse uh, happening completely among a repressed population? Is the discourse I'm interested in studying the dominant discourse? Am I looking at the relationship between a dominant discourse and a repressed discourse? So in order to have that idea, in order to be able to talk about the social structures surrounding the discourse, shaping and framing what's possible to say, it's necessary to undertake that initial unpacking of the social context. After one has done that and one knows what one wants to study, I think then it's a matter of going through these nuts and bolts. And so I want to talk just briefly about what's involved in all of these things. Um, periodicals, I think, are an incredibly rich resource. I would strongly encourage anybody who's doing field research to go and find the archival records in the place where you're doing your field research. There are people who keep archives, and these can be absolute gold mines of information. And it's a, it's a waste to try and recreate this information. Of course, the material that's chosen to put in an archive is itself a censorship process and a series of interventions. But I think this is an incredibly valuable resource. So when I say periodicals, I don't just mean what's going on now, but trying to make use of the information that's available in your study space. Um, mixed media can mean almost anything. I would say it can include street protests, it can include internet engagement, I would consider anonymous and the interventions based by anonymous. So from my own point of view, 
I would consider the hacking of the US government websites by Anonymous to be a discursive intervention. And that would be one of the things that falls into my idea of what's mixed media. But you can also talk about uh, films. One thing to think about here is the documentation of what you have. So, for example, if you're dealing with internet statements, if you're dealing with films, if you're dealing with interventions in the street, then it's important to be careful how you document and record those because you want to have them at your disposal later as data and you want to also be able to reflect on them. So it's one thing to be there and think about what happened. It's another thing altogether to have a record of what happened. And so I would encourage you to, if you're interested in doing this kind of assessments to, or this kind of analysis, to take care and think about how you're going to archive the different materials that you want to collect. So as you think about what do you imagine are the appropriate materials, to also ask yourself that question, what's the appropriate way for me to be compiling, recording, and storing these materials? Um, legal documents and protocols, I think can be an incredibly useful piece of resource material. They tend to be very difficult to read. Uh, they also tend to be written in a language that's not designed to be clear. So it's important to be careful about what you do with them, but they are usually publicly available, so they make a nice resource. Uh, if you want to look at formal political statements, this is a completely different layer of the discourse. And then the last piece that I want to talk about today, and the little line is to indicate that I don't mean to restrict in any way the things that you might unpack, um, is interviews. And I think interviews are an extremely useful tool, but a very dangerous tool. And they're a particularly dangerous tool when what I want to learn about is the discourse. Why would that be the case? Maybe because we are involved uh, in the production of the interview. So this means that then we have a role in the discourse we want to analyze. Exactly. Makes things much more complicated. So if, if I'm a psychologist and I want to interview people to come up with some kind of a measuring of a scale of their uh, happiness or unhappiness or degrees of uh, biological adrenaline flow associated with responses to different types of questions, uh, I can give them an interview and I can do some measuring of their body responses. And I have to be careful about how I s construct my questions. But my objective is not to try and understand what they're trying to say. If instead what I want to understand is what they have been trying to say, then I have to be very careful about how I ask my questions. And so I'm going to talk with you a bit about some uh, discourse analysis that I did where I conducted interview questions and show you a bit about how I went uh, about doing that. Okay. And the other thing that I said I would uh, address a bit, um, we'll have a look at a couple of tools, not because I can train you how to use these tools right now, because that would be impossible, but to give you an idea of how they work, um, is that there's uh, increasingly a lot of uh, software-based discourse analysis being carried out. And there are some interesting options for how one can conduct this kind of analysis. The most popular tool is uh, by far this tool, Atlas T. And so I'll show you just briefly a little bit about it. Um, however, we can also use tools like SPSS. Are you guys familiar with SPSS? Okay, some people not, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then um, the, there's also this uh, tool of cloud analysis. Is anybody familiar with uh, building websites on the clouds? this uh, cloud tool. So there's a tool that's used, oh, well, I start from the end and work my way backwards. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind, these are just three examples. Um, how you choose to process and organize your data in a discourse analysis is, uh, is largely up to you. And I think uh, one of the most important things is not which software you use, but how well you prepare yourself before you use the software so that the software is working for you and not the other way around. 
Um, so cloud analysis is becoming um, quite popular in international um, relations studies at the moment. And basically this is using the tools that are used on internet websites to identify hits. And it's uh, picking up on the Google algorithms for how search inquiries operate and producing bubbles of concentration. So in that respect, it's a sort of a network analysis trying to unpack and look at the way in which different discursive objects are concentrating within a discourse so that you end up with these images of the bubbles like you see on a web page with the one words in big and the other words little and this somehow means that this word got talked about a lot and this word didn't get talked about very much. What might be one of the problems with using this type of analysis? Any ideas? So I have an analysis that takes keywords that I have identified and selected. And then it goes through a series of data sources, periodicals, mixed media, interview results, different kinds of protocols that I may have recorded. Mm -hmm. And it counts the number of instances in which this word was used. And then I get a density function that tells me how big is this word in the discourse and how big is another word in the discourse. So what might be a problem with relying on this type of analysis? It abstracts from the context in which the word was said. So the meaning uh, can be controversial. <coughs> Actually, you have to be careful. So I would be aggregating if I didn't think carefully about it, potentially those in favor and those against a particular instance. So what might be a way around that? This would be a question of how I code my data. So Isabel was talking with you yesterday about data coding. So I would be careful about how I code my data. And as I'm going through my data, I would not just look at whether or not and before I put it into a software, I would tag it in terms of mining yes and mining no. Mining good, mining bad. Or as you'll see in the uh, case I'm going to show you from my own research, uh, mining good, mining bad, or mining ambivalent, which is uh, usually what the real world tells us. Um, and then we have to deal with that. Okay, so this is uh, the idea behind cloud analysis. Again, like I said, whichever tools you're going to end up using, you're going to have to do your own study of how to use them. That's not what I can do for you in the course of a single day talking about this. Um, but precisely these ideas to have the recognition that the way in which I construct my data before I stick it into the computer has substantial consequences for what kind of results are going to come out of my analysis. This is a point that we can unpack and, and think about here. Um, SPSS is, I think, a really powerful and potentially useful tool for discourse analysis. Um, so SPSS is a, a big, very powerful statistical analysis tool. However, one of the functions of this tool is correlations. And one of the potentials that you have in this tool is to create all kinds of ordinarily coded variables. So SPSS holds the potential, depending upon how we approach what we're doing, to encode and provide all kinds of interesting information about the relationships between the different types of statements inside of a discourse. To what degree does the habit of talking about freshwater correlate with the habit of saying no to minds? To what degree does a particular style of orientation in a discourse correlate with other pieces of that discourse? To what degree is there an inverse relationship? When I'm standing here, I'm definitely not going to be standing there. Okay. Um, I don't think that regression analysis, which is what people usually think of when they think about SPSS, is useful for discourse analysis. So regression analysis would be to say, based on the following six factors, I find that uh, this level of education, 
And this type of utterance is correlated with this final position. Uh, my sense is that that's not useful. Um, I want to show you a little bit about Atlas T because I think that Atlas T is exactly the kind of tool that can be useful for discourse analysis. And I have here, if this is going to work, yeah. Um, oh, I have to do it here. Yeah, sorry. Um, so this is the Atlas manual, and this is the Atlas. So. What you can see here is that Atlas demands a huge amount of preparatory work from you before you start sticking data into it. So if you're thinking about doing software-based discourse analysis, please do not be of the impression that you're just going to show up with your documents and scan them into the Borg and it's going to produce results for you. So you have to come up with a series of positions regarding the documents that you're using, their relationships to each other, your position with respect to your study object, and then you have to actually extract from those documents those statements that you have identified as being relevant. So that means if you are on if you are looking at a public political discourse and you're interested in studying official legal documents, you're going to need to read those legal documents and you're going to need to think and reflect for yourself upon where within those legal documents rests the discourse that you want to observe. And it is not going to be the entire document. And then it asks you to do a series of coding exercises. And this coding, oh, sorry, these coding exercises are very important because the coding exercises are basically where you write theory into the analysis. So you tell Atlas, this is this kind of a statement, this is this kind of a statement, or this is a statement associated with this kind of an actor, or this kind of an actor. And Atlas and any discourse analysis software is very semantically open with respect to what you specify. That means that you have to think before you get to the stage of putting your data into a software tool like this, and before you go out into the field to collect your data, how is the data that you're going out to collect going to feed into a software tool like this? The tool has a variety of options for how you can explore and think about the relationships between your objects. This is one of the reasons why I like also to use SPSS, and I'm going to talk with you a little bit about an uh, approach called Q methodology. Um, because the tools available in Atlas are somewhat restricted, and they're oriented around looking at, again, these kinds of clouding condensations and networking weightings and relationships. Of course, as we were just discussing, a network doesn't tell me anything. I have to think about the composition of that network and I have to do some thinking, some evaluation of what its structure is. And then the last thing that I think is very important to keep in mind when you're going to use a tool like this is what are you going to end up with at the end? So do you want to make visual representations? Then you're going to have to think about that when you're doing your coding. Do you want to make uh, statement collections? Are you looking for just words? Is words enough for you? Maybe words are enough. Maybe you have a Foucauldian position that says that I don't care about the meaning behind the word. Maybe words are not enough for you, so you need to have a completely a separate and additional layer where you're assigning to statements and utterances some other layer of meaning. So when you think about the data that you're going to collect. I recommend that you, if you want to use a tool like this, read this tool, familiarize yourself with it, and ask yourself what is the end product coming out of this tool before you even start preparing to go out into the field. And as I said, it, the time that we have at our disposal, that's about as much as I can say about this. Um, but what I can do is to kind of show you um, how many of you guys have worked with Atlas T up until now? Okay. So I'm going to show you um, 
a freeware tool. I think it's, is it going to work? See if it's going to work. Yeah. Now this is, I had one, I had a blue Peter, but it doesn't make it easy. And this is it. No, this is the older version. I'm sorry. My blue Peter is not here. Um, I had one with data inside of it, but I apparently don't have it. But that's okay. Um, so what you can see is the structure here of how a tool like this would work. So I'm going through my documents, and I pull out my statements or my words, and I go in here and I start putting them into the structure. But here I have, as we were talking about, some kind of information about the social positioning of that individual. So the statement in and of itself is utterly meaningless. The statement could only have meaning in terms of how it's related to a particular context, social discourse, or institutional structure. So I have to put in information about who sent it, to what degree does it agree with other statements, what categories have I assigned it, and then I have the text itself. And this is a tool, this is a freeware tool that I think is quite nice that you guys can download and use if you don't want to buy Atlas. Um, and I don't think it, Atlas does a whole lot more than this tool, honestly. Um, and so this uh, tool gives you a couple of options in terms of uh, finding self-contradictions within statements and finding um, relationships between the statements. And then you have to go through a process where you actually, and that's what I would have shown you in my Blue Peter that's not there, I'm sorry. Um, you have to go through a process of telling the program which statements are related to which other statements in which way. So you need to think about this before you start collecting your data if you're imagining that you're going to use a software program to help you analyze your data. Did you have a comment or just a sore of hand? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bit less fun without the Blue Peter, so I guess we'll move on. Okay. So, so and of course, this one also has a manual. So this is the Discourse Network Analyzer Manual, created by Philip Leifeld, who apparently built this program as part of doing his PhD. Uh, I also like the example because it gives you the insight that you can build your own. And you're going to see the ramshackle, cobbledy thing I built to do some of the discourse analysis that I'm going to talk to you about. So I would encourage you not to imagine that out there, there's some software that's going to resolve all of your discourse analysis problems for you but instead to imagine that the software can facilitate your work and the quality of the output from your use of that software is directly proportional to the quality of the input. So garbage in, garbage out. So, and again, if you have a look, the manual from Philip is very similar in terms of having a huge amount of demands from you about the preparation of your data. Yeah, handle with care. Um, machines should not be operated without drivers. Um, these are tools that we can use, but if you imagine that this tool is going to do your analysis for you, not only are you going to end up with an analysis of poor quality, but you may very well end up making arguments that have nothing to do with what you want to say. And if you are not careful at the beginning, you will pay the price at the end. So, uh, the, oh, sorry, yeah, handle with care. 
Uh, the last thing that I want to do before we break is uh, run through some illustrations. Um, not because these are the things that you should do, but because I hope that they give you some kind of an insight into the various different ways in which you could do discourse analysis. So I'm going to talk with you a bit about Q methodology, which I think is quite an interesting approach to discourse analysis. Uh, I think it's nice as a complement to theory. I don't think it's sufficient on its own. Uh, and then also how I've used the concept of multiple intelligence in my own work as a tool for structuring critical theory. And then I'm also going to talk about this uh, text that I wrote with uh, Pera, uh, looking at the windmill sighting in, uh, in Catalonia, uh, mainly because Pera did an enormous amount of intensive empirical field work that we then uh, were able to use to conduct this analysis in that paper. So I think it's a really nice illustration of how one puts together the discourse. Okay, so. Um, Q methodology, how many of you are familiar with Q methodology? Okay, a little bit. I think it's a really interesting tool. Um, it's, an, it's a systems approach to survey research design um, and historically, it comes from uh, a project of mixing together statistical analysis and psychology. So reflecting on the idea that large and statistical analysis is not providing us with useful information about the motivations behind why actors do the things that they do, but somehow still having the idea that having rigorous mathematically-based analysis of the structure of a situation is useful. And I think it's quite an elegant solution to the problem. And the basic structure of how it works is factor analysis. And I'll go through in a second the typical steps in a Q methodology approach. The idea is to do two phases of an interview or a survey research process. And in the first phase, you ask extremely open-ended questions. And these provide you with a set of discursive interventions, a set of utterances that you can then begin to look at in terms of their correlations with each other. You then conduct a, a factor analysis where you try to cluster these types of utterances together into groups and identify what are the thematics that came out of these very open interview questions. You then go back and this step is not necessarily used, but I think it's the better way to use the tool, you can then take these products of the factor analysis and use them to construct more targeted interview questions. What this does is it helps us to deal with precisely this problem we were just discussing, that I can find a way to make my interview questions to some degree constructed by the people I want to interview. And in that respect, I think it's a really nice tool for uh, discourse analysis. So, um, yeah, so the typical steps, you first have this open-ended interview um, with either a focus group or an entire target group that are used to derive these statements. You then have this factor analysis, which is usually done with software, maybe with SPSS, where you can conduct the clustering, there are also, there's a journal about Q methodology. So if you think you might like this tool, you've got a great body of resources at your disposal to pick it up and work with it. And then, as I said, you may or may not subsequently use this factor analysis to construct your interviews. And then finally, the interviews are analyzed using statistical methods. The logic behind it is that once I have eliminated this hermeneutic problem as a consequence of having involved the interview subjects in the production of the interview questions, the rigor of my statistical analysis regarding their subjective perceptions of the situation is substantially improved. So one approach. Um, now I want to uh, show you another approach. And this, yeah. Called qmethod.org, 
which has access to all the tools and actually the program used for Q methodology is freeware, so you can, I mean, any, you can use it freely. And there's a very good manual which explains the whole steps of where, like Kate summarized here. Uh, these are explained, like the statistical rigor of the analysis is explained in much more detail for those who are looking behind the, the whole idea of how it is done. So I think it might be useful. It's like qmethod.org. Um, and obviously you can go talk to Edman about it as well. <laughs> okay, so now I want to jump to a completely different idea, which is uh, to take a theoretical reference frame and to use that to organize what you're going to study, how you're going to conduct your interviews. And for that, I'm just going to show you um, some slides uh, reflecting some field data that I collected during uh, empirical research that I have done back in 2006 and 7 and 8. And so I'm going to start here um, with one piece of information. So I have uh, the interview guidelines that I used for this study. And before I mention anything else, I just want to mention, because I, I will forget to come back to it. Um, yeah, don't worry, it's in German. You don't have to understand what it says. Uh, <laughs> this is a letter sent out to people I wanted to interview. But more importantly, Uh, the presentation of myself and my research on the day of the interview, um, which is more or less a repeat of the information about um, the letter it, that's in the letter. The reason I mention this is because I think it's even more important, I think it's always important in interviewing, and I'm sure Isabella talked with you about this, to make sure that the people you're interviewing understand why you're doing what you're doing. But in a situation where what we want to do is to understand their meaning, assignment, I think it's crucial that we explain to them why we're studying what we're studying. And in this case, I'm using a particular cognitive tool and I needed to explain it to them. So I have a very long introduction here. And then at the end of that, I have these very critical questions which I'm sure Isabel talked to you about yesterday, asking if I can come back, asking if I can use the data, and asking them what I think is the most important interview question. Is there something you think I should have asked you that I didn't? I don't expect you guys to follow or understand everything I'm gonna show you right now. Um, what I want to show you is a different approach and to give you a basic idea of what I mean when I suggest that we can have a theoretical frame that helps us to structure the way that we approach a discourse. So we can start by saying I have a, a pre-existing theory about the characteristics of my study object that informs the types of questions I ask. And so in this case, um, let's see, where is it? Da, 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 da. I have a series of questions and I'm asking them with respect at the discourse level to a series of decisions that were taken by a group of actors. In this case, I'm studying decisions taken collaboratively between scientists and non-scientists. And so one point of orientation is my decision questions. This is a list of all of the actors I'm interviewing, and I ask the people to identify what I call their epistemological resonance with other actors and I gave them a framework by which to categorize their epistemological positions. So I'm gonna show you that in a second. And the epistemological resonance questions were informed by my study of the theory of multiple intelligences which comes from cognitive psychology. So then as I said, I communicated to them the aims of the questionnaire and I have some results. I want to show you the multiple intelligences table that I used in the interview. Uh, 
I asked the people about their institutional setting. I asked them about demographic data, ordinary things that you put into an interview. I asked them which discourses they were involved in out of a selection that I had identified previously. And then I asked them to deal with this questionnaire. And this questionnaire is based on these categories from cognitive psychology. So there's nine categories, and these categories are ways of knowing. And what I was interested in studying was the degree of resonance, conflict, and compatibility with di different ways of knowing among the actors involved in discourse. The theory behind this is based on the work of Hannah Arendt. And the logic from the theory in Hannah Arendt is that it is impossible to judge without thinking, and it is impossible to think without knowing. And on that basis, I argued that if I could identify points of epistemological resonance, resonance at the level of knowing between scientific and non-scientific actors, then perhaps I could reveal patterns of how thinking and judgment, and judgment in that respect being about politics, were operating within these discourses. The main thing that I want to point out to you is that I spent six months preparing this table. <laughs> and I invested another three months in preparing the questions that come after it. Why? Because I needed to take the theory of cognitive psychology that I wanted to employ, and I needed to translate it, first of all, into something that I could use to structure my analysis of the discourse, but also into something that my respondents could comprehend. So, you have here the English version. Eventually, this got translated into German as well. So the content is not so important. If you're interested about it, I can talk to you about all the content stuff later. I think it's a really cool theory. I think it's almost impossible to use as an empirical study tool. I would strongly advise against it. Um, but the basic logic is that you have these different ways of knowing, and it's a critique of the IQ. So, as I said, the main point I want to make is that I spent six months trying to put together this table, reading everything I could get my hands on about the theory, including how it's used in education and how it's applied, and how it's applied as an assessment tool in primary and secondary schools. I finally ended up with manuals used at adult education facilities in the United States because I needed to understand how does this theory apply to the adult mind, not to the child mind. Because as I went through the materials, I realized that the pedagogical materials available with respect to the theory about the child's mind are fundamentally different from those about the adult mind. So it's just to give you a feeling for what's involved in using a particular theory. So then I went through and I asked them a series of questions about the degree to which, first of all, they identified with these intelligences as a self-assessment the degree to which they felt that they were important for their participation in the discourse. And then I asked them about the degree to which they felt they had epistemological affinity with other actors in the discourse. And now I just want to show you some of the results of that analysis. Okay, so um, when I looked at the results of these interviews, When I looked at the results of these interviews, I had started out with positive and negative, and my interview subjects gave me two additional categories for the resonance with other actors, one of which was ambivalent, they didn't care, and the other of which was uh, ambiguous, so sometimes uh, one way, sometimes another. So how can I take this kind of data and turn it into a discourse analysis? Well, I looked at these resonance relationships, and so I said, how many times did an individual actor get identified by another actor in terms of a resonance relationship? So this allowed me to distinguish the actors into two categories, nodes and secondary actors, because I had a bimodal distribution. So here's the number of significations that an actor received and then here's the number of actors 
with that number of significations. So that means that I had nine, I had eight actors who were signified or identified about their epistemological resonance by nine other actors. And then I had a much smaller number over here that had a higher number of significations. So I decided to put my structuring of the analysis into this bimodal uh, frame. This is the material that I used to collect the data, and I looked at the institutional structures and the individuals within them. So I applied the same categories to the institutions and to the discourse that I did to the individual self-assessments. Um, these are a variety of different organizations that were involved in the decision-making process that I was studying. The decision-making process was about land use in the south of the, uh, the region of Saxony in Germany. So one of the things I identified was that there is this resonance within those institutional actors with a heavy weighting towards the categories of logical, mathematical, and visual spatial. The results are not so important right now. What I want to talk with you about is that I had to figure out a way to code these institutions. So how could I do that? I used their websites, I used their public brochures, and I used the material that I had collected to produce that table that took me six months to inform my reading of the different types of statements made by these organizations. And it fits quite well in the end with the logic of the situation because this is about land use planning and there's a huge amount of GIS involved and there's a huge amount of mapping involved. Okay. So then I did the same kind of coding for the different decisions and the discourses. So I coded the discourse itself. And then I tried to look at the relationship between this discourse and the institutional structure. And then finally, between the individual actors. So these are self-assessments by actors. And these self-assessments are relating to, at the one side, the actor's view of their own uh, strengths and the degree to which they're used in a discourse. So we have different participant number here. So actor assessment of intelligence used in Renat for importance and with frequency of use. So. Yeah, this actor didn't want to talk to me. Uh, which itself is kind of interesting. And up here we have uh, the self-assessment as judged against their assessment of the importance in the discourse. So the fun stuff comes at the end. So some people had a very high opinion of their strengths. Um, and what I was looking for here was correlation between self-assessment and the structure of the discourse. But the point I want to make is not about the results. The point is that there's a huge amount of work that had to go into trying to construct this kind of an assessment. So the final results is these network maps where I have the actor's self-assessment of their distribution of skills and their assessment of their importance of these skills for achieving success within the discourse and their idea of their relationship not, sorry, not their idea of their relationship to other actors, but the resonance pattern across, given to me by the entire community of interviewed subjects. And so, potentially, we can see some interesting information here. Here I have a chi-square test that's designed to tell me whether or not the pattern of this network is statistically significantly different from a random pattern. So to what degree is this pattern actually different from the overall pattern of the discourse. So here I have the structure of their relationships. Here I have an individual who had an average negativity that was not primarily associated with them and has good compatibility between their self-assessment, the structure of the discourse, and the discursive problem. This is a scoping study, so it's not an empirical result, but it's intended to give you an idea of the kinds of things that you can do. Um, and then my favorite actor is uh, this one. So this is the other side. So this actor had a below average level of negativity as a field of negativity coming from other actors in the network. However, it was all focused on this actor. This actor was my unwilling participant who refused to engage in a self-assessment. 
only was willing to assess the discourse. And that self the discourse assessment was very compatible with my discourse assessment. However, we don't know what was her own self-assessment. I also have an actor who had a very strong incompatibility with their assessment of their own strengths and weaknesses and the discourse. Okay, so from their own kind of boring, some actors are not very important, some are. Okay, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to show you that as an example of the amount of work that's involved in producing a discourse analysis if you want to use a theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that already exists to inform how you're going to construct it. And then uh, the, oh, sorry, the last one I wanted to show you. Sorry, go ahead. What was the uh, result of this study? I mean, what was the outcome? On one side, my conclusion was that this tool is extremely difficult to use as a support tool for empirical discourse analysis. Um, and so that's one of the conclusions of the study. Um, the other conclusion I have in, with regard to results of the study is that the idea that epistemological resonance has meaning for understanding how dialogue takes place between scientists and non-scientists is, is absolutely valid. Because every way that I look at the patterns across the data that I did collect, there is statistical robustness to the distinctions. So I have strong correlations in structure, and I have statistical robustness in those correlations. The problem is that the case study is very small and so I have good rigor inside of what I've constructed, but it's not something that I can use to extrapolate to other cases. So it's a, the conclusion is this is worth studying further, which is kind of a lame conclusion, but that's the conclusion of the study. But so it was a study about the methodology and not about the content of the... <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say not about the content, but it was a study intended to look at developing this kind of an approach to analyzing discourse. Yeah. So it was a study to test the plausibility of replacing the idea of utterances with the idea of epistemological disposition. Does that make sense? or leaning the idea of utterances against the idea of epistemological disposition. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah, so in that respect, yeah, I think you could say, well, I'm a theorist, so my results are theory, which, yeah, well, we can talk about that too later. <laughs> theory, I think it's Eleanor Ostrom once said that, um, uh, nothing is useful as a good theory. Okay, so um, this one has some more get your hands on it results for you, um, which is some work that I did with uh, Pera. Um, and what I wanted to do is just show you this quick frame and then I'll show you some of the data and we'll leave it at that. We can talk about these things after lunch if we like to. Um, so again, this is the idea that a discourse analysis needs to somehow have a theoretical framework behind it. So I need to be talking about something if I'm going to be able to say something. So what I was talking about in the previous case was this idea of using epistemology to help us understand the structure of political discourses between scientists and non-scientists. Here, Pera and I are using the concept of one-dimensional thinking from Herbert Marcuse to try and help us structure an analysis of discourse concerning windmill siting in Catalonia. And so again, this table is what took us the most time to produce out of everything in the paper. Well, aside from the field work, so don't forget about that. Uh, <laughs> but between the two, you've got a lot of work to do if you want to do discourse analysis. Um, so what we have here in this table is uh, conceptualizations regarding the topics of the discourses and conceptualizations regarding the realm of justification or the character of the discourse, the way in which the discourse was argued. So in many respects, this is more Habermasian, I would say, than it is Foucauldian uh, or more modernist. 
Marcuse is a reasonably modernist thinker. So to start out with, I just want to show you these categories, and then I want to show you the data um, appendix. So, and then Giacomo wants us to go to lunch. So um, when we think about the idea that we've collected data, that we have utterances, that we have a discursive interventions that we want to analyze, we must have some kind of a structure to analyze them. And so you can see here the way that uh, we have placed these different discursive objects within that analytical framework that I just presented to you. So over here, we have different narrative moments, different events in the history of the discourse, and we identified four periods. And we said this discourse has four different moments of transformation. And then we coded and evaluated the interventions for each of those moments with respect to these categories that I just showed you in the previous table. These are our words, not the words of the study objects. And each of these moments, we assigned a label. Then, da -da -da, the maps, which are also a description of the discourse. And then we have the storylines that we extracted from the interviews and the material that Pera had studied. So here we have a discourse, main actor groups, who they were comprised of, a description of the group. Then we have a set of analytical tables where we place these different coalitions, these actors and their utterances into that analytical framework that we had constructed. So here we have a storyline. We have statements that comprise that storyline, a weighting of their importance within the storyline in each of the phases, and a weighting of their position within the overall discourse. So here we're trying to look simultaneously at how the composition of a particular storyline changed over time, and how that constituted potentially a positioning within the discourse. And we have these categories of facts and values, or means and ends, and eventually what we concluded So each of the different discourses and the different structures. And the conclusion, which you can read in the paper with Pera, or actually, it's not with Pera, and I'm with Pera, so just to be clear about that. Um, the conclusion we came to in this case was that we could observe, based on the analysis that we had, that we had conducted and constructed, that there was a pressure being exerted within this discourse that led to a situation where the campesinos, who had started out with a value-based discourse about how things should be done, slowly became silenced, and individuals who were able to construct their positions with respect to the facts of the matter and what was the right thing to do technically became more and more powerful in the discourse, and that one of the final stages of the discourse was that the campesinos then began to get involved in making statements that were tending towards the precedent of being about facts and what's technically right, and had begun to surrender their original positions about values, lifestyle, and what was procedurally appropriate. So in this case, we did end up with um, some results that had something to do with the content. So that's my... Uh, overview of some options, and uh, I guess we leave it there and we go to lunch, yeah? yeah. Okay. <laughs>